You ever want to know the financial hacks and tips of the top 1%? It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Brian, I am so excited about this show because it seems like every generation is absolutely infatuated with the rich and the famous and the most successful folks. I mean, if you think about your generation, you guys love the lifestyles of the rich and the famous. Lifestyles of the rich and famous with Robin Leach. You just nailed it. My generation was Cribs, or maybe some of our younger listeners, you guys like to think about keeping up with the Kardashians. So no matter who it is, we're all so curious about what the lives of the rich and famous and successful look like. But can we be honest? Those shows, I don't think they really portray what either. the lives of the rich and famous. It might be what they want you to think That's or right. what they want to portray. Matter of fact, MTV Cribs in particular, mm-hmm. I think it came out later that a lot of the celebrities that were on that show were renting out properties. They were faking. They were staging it. Yep. So just like most things in life, in this new brand new influencer era that we live in where people are doing everything for the gram or TikTok or whatever else, what you see might not be the reality of the situation. So we want to kind of actually help you navigate what is the reality of creating wealth. Now, we're so excited because we get to sit in this unique position. We work with very successful individuals and families all across the country, a number of which actually fall into that top 1%. So we want to share through our experience some of the things, some of the traits, some of the habits we have seen them implement that they would say are a key to their success and how they've ended up where they are. And don't worry, we're going to do this by age, mm-hmm. meaning we're going to go through each decade, but we're also going to give you the data because a lot of you are probably trying to figure out, hey, am I part of that 1%? What is the 1%? Because it's not the aspirational lifestyle. It's actually what your income looks mm-hmm. like, what your assets look like. We're going to hook you up. Okay, Brian, so let's jump in. Let's start talking about folks at the beginning of their careers, in the early stages, probably the ones that are most dialed into the influencers, into the Instagrammers, into the the TikTokers, what do the actual top 1% of folks in their 20s look like? Well, if you look at the average income, if you want to be considered in your 20s in the top 1%, you need to have an income of at least $160,000 in 2023. I, I was actually surprised. That's, that's pretty high. I know mm-hmm. we have quite a few people who come in to our Q&A shows that they actually resemble this, but still, based upon my own life experience, it that takes a high. lot to make six figures in your 20s. And if you look at the net worth of the top 1%, this was actually median net mm-hmm. worth. If you looked at this, it was $577,000. So that's pretty remarkable. And most of us can think back to our 20s, thinking about having an income at that realm, or, or more specifically, a net worth at that realm, that's unique. That is not the common part. That is not the outlier. Dare I say, 99% of folks do not fall into this category. That's why it's the top 1%. But that is, in fact, where the numbers are. I'm amazed to see this level of net worth already so early means you must have figured something out, mm-hmm. whether it's... um. You know, to have a good income, to already have net worth, it means you're probably living on less than you make Mm -hmm. or you have good deferred gratification skills. There's something there that is making this possible. Yeah, these folks have likely figured out that the earlier I can understand how powerful discipline can be, the earlier I can figure out if I'm willing to sacrifice a few of my dollars today for something better in the future, the better off I will be. So we would argue that folks in their 20s that have been able to achieve either this level of income or this level of net worth, Worth, have likely made some sacrifices to get there. They understand that deferring gratification in the future can be a winning proposition. I also think it's important they understand the value of time. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you, what do we try to have resources for? I mean, in addition to funding goals, it's also so your money can work for That's you. Right. And, and time is money. And also, money is you own your life, which is aka you own your time. That's not something to be wasted. And if you want to see just how powerful time can be for you, go out to our website, moneyguide.com slash resources. And we have this deliverable that we call the Wealth Multiplier for Young Savers. And basically it shows what every dollar can turn into into for you by the time you retire, starting at age zero. So someone who starts at zero, what their wealth multiplier can be, or someone who's age 20, what their dollar can turn into, or someone who's 30, what their dollar can turn into. Well, you can see when you look through the numbers on this deliverable that the earlier you start, the more time you have for your money to work, 
the more powerful it can be for you. So, Bo, let's talk about the hacks they've used to kind of fuel this success. Um, and this is something we had a lot of discussion about sure. in, in our show prep is you're like, okay, look, to, to, to have this level of net worth, you either inherited it mm-hmm. or you have to have a tremendously high income or created something or you had, where you had some something. big windfall that's come your way. Um, but it, I think to even – let's give people the, 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 the kudos, though. If you are somebody, even with the high income, to actually turn this into net worth, if you created this from zero – you have to be living on a lot less than you make, meaning that you have low living expenses relative to your income. Maybe you're even doing house hacking. Mm-hmm. We we all know we've done con we've covered content that Graham has done. Mm-hmm. Graham for a while was you know totally house hacking while he built his real estate empire. There's unique things that go on to create this it's, early it's, success. Yeah, it's not uncommon. You know, if you go watch some of Alex Ramosi stuff, he talks about how. Early on in his career, even though he was making incomes of two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars, he had figured out how to get his living expenses down to fifteen hundred dollars a month. He was living in a single room with four or five other roommates that were also renting. There are ways to do that, but frankly, being in the top one percent in your twenties is not an easy thing. It's not something that is commonly available to the majority of folks out well, there. Well, and I, and I want to because. Look, a lot of us, we're going to see this, and, and I always want everything we do to be motivating. Mm-hmm. I want you to actually feel like, hey, these guys are breaking it down. They're actually showing the details, but they're also giving me a path towards my own success. Being confessional, I didn't resemble this in my 20s. Mm-hmm. Um, I took some some big risk in my 20, my late 20s after my father passed away, but I but I had some goals of like hitting $100,000 by the time I was 30. I didn't reach it on, mm-hmm. on the income goal. Um, I definitely didn't have this level of net worth that we've just covered here because, yes, I took risk. I took some necessary steps in my 20s, but not enough time had passed for this to actually fulfill. And I think that's where a lot of you, even if you are financial mutants and you're going to be tremendously successful, do not get discouraged if all of the success does not manifest in the 20s. That's what is portrayed out there on some of these shows, but that's not the reality, so hang in there. And what I think is so interesting is as we move through these ages, as we move through these decades, we're going to talk about how attainable some of these top 1% numbers are. It's difficult in the 20s. Even if you are someone who hits that level of income and you have 160, 180, 200, $250,000 of income coming in because of exactly what Brian said, you might have not had enough time to get to that net worth level. However, just because you're not in the top 1% in your 20s does not mean that being in the top 1% in your 30s is something that will evade you. Yeah, so let's jump into the 30s because I think this is important. If you want to know where the income is for the top 1% for those in the 30s, is $347,000. That's, That's jumping up pretty big. Net worth, median net worth for top 1% is $3.3 million. <laughs> Um, that's that's not a small sum of money either. So it's kind of interesting how, how the, these numbers came to be. Now, and again, we want to we want to make sure that we're clear. Just because you were not in the top one percent of your twenties does not mean that you would not be in the top one percent in your thirties. But look at how those numbers change. We said that the the average net worth, or the median net worth, to be in the top one percent in your twenties was somewhere around half a million dollars, or a little bit greater than that. You can see how powerful compounding can be. Not just for the top one percenters, but for everybody in their 30s. If you can put in the work early, the numbers build quickly. That's why in order to be in the top one percent in your 30s, you are now a multi-millionaire in order to be able to do that. If you can start early, the numbers move and compound very, very quickly. Well, let's look at some of the things that have to have happened for this to even work out. And so what have they figured out? The first thing you know, and we had discussion about this too, Bo, is because you don't have to have a partner. You don't have to be married, but you definitely didn't pick a bad mm-hmm. partner or a bad spouse to end up at this level of success. Now, you know, the number has been changing about how early folks are now getting married. You know, the average age of marriage has been increasing a little bit, but it's been pretty common that if you look at the average tenure of marriages that don't work, something happens around that seven to 10 year range. You know, they call it colloquially the the seven year itch where things start breaking down and things aren't moving in the perfect direction. Well, it's not uncommon for folks in their 30s to have recognized, okay, maybe that decision I made in my 20s, this isn't working, this isn't the person I want to be with. Well, the devastating fact is, apart from the emotional damage, apart from the mental damage, apart from the relational damage that comes from that, 
there is significant financial damage that happens when individuals work through divorce. Yeah, I mean, if you actually look at the data, we've shown this stat before, but I think it's worth kind of diving a little deeper into it. Here's what's on the slide. Those divorcing experience an overall drop in wealth of 77%. Mm-hmm. Well, what goes into that? Not only is it the cost of actually divvying up the assets mm-hmm. in half, but there has to be something above and beyond that. And here's what the research shows. This actually goes four years from the date of divorce. Mm-hmm. Prior to the yeah, date of divorce. prior to the actual divorce date. Because what you'll see, and everybody, if you've been around long enough like I have, you've seen when couples, unfortunately, it's not working out, and they get into an arms race. So like if one is spending money mm-hmm. in an unhealthy way, the, the other spouse will be like, well, I'll show them, and they'll spend money. Decisions starting to be made not in a healthy way to actually build wealth, but more of the destructive, I've got to get mine because mm-hmm. you get into this arms race. It's very unhealthy. So you see the dysfunction is not just in the separation of the assets. It's actually, there's a lot of writing on the wall that something healthy is not occurring here. So when it comes to making large financial decisions, and potentially one of the largest financial decisions you will ever make is who you choose to be your lifelong partner. You want to make sure you put a lot of time and thought and effort into that so that you can make it well. So one of the traits that people in the 30s figured out is they did not pick a bad or the wrong partner. Here's another thing that they did. They figured out what it is that they love to do vocationally, and they've actually started doing it. They do something that they love doing for a living. Yeah, I mean, I I thought the stats were pretty amazing on this. 86% of millionaires say they enjoy what they do for a living. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they're probably, I think a lot of people don't, they they, they wonder chicken or egg, meaning that do people get rich because, uh, you know, they just have this great income coming in. That's why they love what they do. From my own walk and as well as dealing with clients, I think the, the, the money a lot of times is a side effect to actually being completely engrossed in what you're doing yep. for a living. I mean, I, I never thought when I got that first iPod that when I started the the, the Money Guy show, the, the the podcast, that was supposed to be just an education platform, just, just a, a passion, passion project. But as you can see, it has turned into, and, I, and I, I'm unapologetic about, the greatest marketing mm-hmm. idea by accident because I really did. My passion was there to help people make better decisions, and I absolutely – love coming to work. Now, look, I enjoy vacations. I enjoy hanging out with my family. But when I'm away from this place too long, I do start to go, man, I need to get back in there because I just love coming to work every day. And I think that I'm not the only successful person that feels that way. Yeah, there was a study, uh, study done by Acorns looking at millionaires, and it found out that millionaire entrepreneurs who were able to channel their passion into a successful business idea carry an average net worth of almost seven and a half million dollars. So, If you can do what you love, there's a good chance that you're going to do it really, really well. And there's a good chance that you're going to be successful at it. Brian, we have a dear client who we've worked with for over a decade now. And we asked him, hey, what was the key? You know, all of your kids turned out to be successful. What was it that you did that changed them? He said, all I did was tell them, no matter what you do, whether you want to go into engineering or accounting or be a hairdresser, or if you just want to be a dishwasher, if you can figure out how to love what you do and be in the top 10% of the folks that do that thing, you'll be amazed that the money tends to follow folks who pursue their vocation with a passion. Yeah, if you can make yourself stand out from your your peers, you're actually world-class, you have an aptitude and a talent for what you do for a living, and it shows, it kind of just happens. I mean, the, Mm -hmm. the, the cream rises to the top. I think you'll be really impressed if you follow your passion, but it do. Spend time, don't have just a job, Try to figure out the career or the industry or the aptitude that really brings you joy every day when you get to do it. And if you can pursue that, I think you'll find that the money kind of happens. Another thing that one percenters have figured out in their 30s is that they've recognized the value of having a really great team around them. They don't try to be an expert in every single avenue they operate. So they might have a really good financial advisor or a good accountant or good attorneys or good support characters or good colleagues. They know how to surround themselves with people who are also motivated to help them be better at what it is they do on a day-to-day basis. Well, look, this is one I had to to, to learn about is because, and, and look, here's where how this plays out. A lot of times, if you're financially minded, like when you buy your house, you're like, man, what did that real estate agent really do for me? Mm-hmm. And a lot of us want to be do-it-yourselfers on all these levels. But I will tell you, if you're successful, you're going to find out that, yes, you could put time in. You have the aptitude where you could figure out how to do the job of 
the, the, the CPA and do your own taxes. You could sell your own house like a real estate agent does. You could even do your own financial planning. But there will come a point where your time is so valuable, mm-hmm. plus time is such a scarce resource, that instead of you trying to figure out how to be an expert at everything, why don't you bring somebody in? Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I've been very confessional also. Like I'm going through this literary process. Sure. I thought originally I could do this on my own because I, you know, look, just carry it front to back, write a book. That's I am it. a do-it-yourselfer on a lot of things, but then once again, I was like, when you're googling terms and you're doing all these other stuff, I was like, no, I need a, I need an agent. I asked around, and I got to tell you, going through the process now, the agent is worth every penny, mm-hmm. and I feel the same way when we're talking to our clients. I think a lot of people come into professional services with some level of skepticism because you're like, hey, can you show me that you add value? Because now I can just buy index funds. Why would I need somebody? A good person that's going to be on your team should be able to show value and value value that's tangible to you as you grow your your wealth. Do that. Mm -hmm. So that way you can focus on what you're good at, which is generating income that leads and turns into wealth. And that's actually a beautiful segue, Brian. Let's talk about some of the things that folks in their 30s, inside of the 1%, some hacks they've used to achieve their success. Here's one. Now, again, this is just in our experience. This is not a necessity, but it is not uncommon that those folks who fall into the 1% in their 30s, they have figured out how to create multiple sources of income. It may have been something where they have their day job, but they also figured out how to do something else that generates income. Maybe it's a side hustle, maybe it's a gig, maybe it's consulting, maybe it's program, maybe it's real estate, but they have figured out how to create multiple sources of income coming into them instead of just one singular source. Well, I I think this is important to draw attention to and the fact that there's so much content out there on how you should create multiple sources. I have found from myself as well as a bunch of clients, Sometimes this is just part of the process. Yep. You're you're a solution finder. It's you know I've made jokes in the past about you give a mouse a piece of cheese or whatever that childhood book is. It shows how things get rolling. My own experience, I started off to do a company in one way, but you know which was doing tax returns mm-hmm. and financial planning. But then what do you know? Once we start doing content creation, it starts having its own income stream, and then the building need. I mean, the business needed a place mm-hmm. to be, so we ended up buying a building, and that's all these things. It was not on. It was it was deliberate, but it was deliberate out of necessity. It was not because I was trying to automatically create complexity in my life. That's something when I was a young CPA doing tax returns, I would see the tax returns of what I perceived as very successful people. See all the K ones and all the sources Looks and be super like, sexy. I just need to have that because that's what I say. I'm telling you, you try to strive to create a simplified, successful life, but complexity is just mm-hmm. going to naturally find you because it's just what needs to happen in the next progress or the next step of your journey to wealth building. So don't try to hurry up the process too much. That's what it's kind of like dating in some way. You know, like say, when do you find your best, you know, soulmate is usually when you're, when not, you're not looking, looking for, for it. Well, this is this is when I have found in my journey is. Be very mindful of opportunities that come your way, but don't force them. Because as Warren Buffett talks about, a lot of times success is also how often you say no. Mm -hmm. So don't just force something just because you think it sounds sexy or you heard somebody say that they did it. Make sure it really does fit into your goals, your why, and where you're trying to go with your financial life. Again, that's a perfect segue. We know when we think about traits of millionaires, we learn from the millionaire next door, one of the traits of millionaires is that, is that they recognize opportunity, exactly what you're talking about. They know what to say yes to and what to say no to. When we think about the 30-year-olds with whom we work, who are in the 1%, a common thread that has been true of these folks is they make sure that they maintain plenty of liquidity and not just emergency reserves to cover the emergencies and not just living expenses to make sure that they can cover their lifestyle, but they have liquidity available so that if an amazing opportunity happens or if a recession comes along or if some business endeavor presents itself, they are positioned in a place where they can actually take advantage of that. Whereas if they did not have liquidity, they would not be able to do well, that. Well, I think this is where entrepreneurial fear kicks mm-hmm. in. I mean, I, I, I know I've ex- watched so many clients As you start making money, you start wondering, will this be here next year? Will this Mm -hmm. be here five years? There's a fear that this is all going away. So a lot of people are very deliberate with, hey, I better start saving some of this money, building some some independence outside of this income stream because it could all go away tomorrow. That's when we talk about liquidity. It's not just cash. It's meaning you're building assets 
you're building investments outside of your business or what you do in your day job so that you do have, you're on the path to independence, independent of what you do in your day job. That's right. Another hack that we've seen that they often do is they use, we're going to call them advanced in quote strategies to amplify their wealth building. What they do is they understand the risk and reward trade-off. And in a number of instances that we've seen, they took a big risk early on and in their thirties, that risk began to pay off. Maybe that was starting a business or maybe that was buying a commercial building or doing some sort of real estate investment. And now that they've made it through the gauntlet, they've made it through the difficult part of that, they are beginning to see the fruits of that labor. That's an advanced strategy that not a lot of people employ, but those who do and who it works out well for are rewarded for that on the other end. Well, and here's the hacker habit I always try to explain when I'm talking to other business owners is that, yes, you took the risk, but as the reward starts to come in, don't squander That's the right. opportunity. Try to be very efficient. That's why, you know, do figure out how backdoor Roth mm -hmm. IRAs work. Try to figure out how health savings accounts. Yes, there's some, those are very basic things, but you'll find as you start having success, you want to make sure you understand. I'll, I'll tell you another thing, Bo, as we were figuring it out, as, as you have success, there are going to be what I call rich people stuff, like mm -hmm. cost segregation, Absolutely. advanced depreciation when you do real estate and other things. Don't miss out. If you start having success, this is back to expand your team. Yes, this might be the first time you've crossed into seven figures and you're trying to figure out how do I do this well. Don't wait because you're so worried about paying fees that you don't maximize the opportunity to, to meet somebody who can maybe guide you that way with you know so you maximize and, and don't screw up this this big thing that's come your way. Now it's interesting, Brian. We're talking about what's required to be in the top one percent in the twenties, and that's really, really difficult. In the 30s, maybe it's more attainable, but it's not broadly attainable to everyone. What I think is interesting is that we shift into the 40s, I do feel like potentially we're now hitting a swath of the population that it might not require the special thing. It might not require the business idea. It might not require the entrepreneurship. It might just require really, really good decision-making and to, time, and time yeah. to find yourself in this place in the 40s. When we look at the top 1% in their 40s, the average income for someone in the top 1% is four hundred. dollars in 21, almost $22,000 here in 2023. Well, I think it's so important because a lot of people, they, they don't realize. We all get, because of those TV shows we threw out in the beginning between Cribs, um, you know, the lifestyles of the rich and famous, we all envision the fabulous 20 and 30-year-olds, mm -hmm. but the reality is most millionaires hit it around 47 mm -hmm. years of age. That is the age. That's why the millionaire next door calculation, a lot of things don't work when you're under 40. It's because you just hadn't had enough time for you to be disciplined. Remember those three ingredients of wealth, which is the discipline that creates the margin or the money that gets invested, but you got to have enough time for it to actually mm -hmm. grow. That's why 40s, is an exciting period because now you actually have been in the workforce for over two decades. Your discipline, your margin, or the money you've invested has actually had enough to actually create some fruits for you. Now, what I think is interesting is, is when we look at the top 1% of net worth, before I bring it up on the screen, it's still a big number. It's and big. we don't want to minimize that it's still a big number, but it's not a number that is $50 million, $100 million. I think it's that's not even decamillion. I think that's what we have in our minds. If you want to be in the top 1% in your 40s, the median net worth of someone in that strata is about $8 million. Now, that is a lot of money. Dare I say it's in the top 1% of all the folks in the 40s. It is a lot of money, but it is not unattainable for someone who's had some career success, who's understood deferred gratification, who's made wise decisions with their finances through their 20s and 30s, we actually see these people in real life, in real form with the folks we work with on an everyday basis. Well, let, let's jump into what they figured out, because I think this one's going to probably get some eye rolls, but I, this is our experience mm -hmm. of what we've dealt with. The first thing we wrote down was they figured out how to help others find success. Huge. I think a lot of people, just like I explained that a lot of successful people, they pursue the passions, they pursue their aptitude and what they're good at, and then the money is kind of a side effect. And a lot of people are surprised to hear that. Well, I think it's the same thing. When I meet a lot of successful people, I'm sure we all have the Ebenezer Scrooge stories and the other things that are the cautionary tales, but a lot of people we have come into contact and deal with, they have this abundance mindset that, yes, they are successful, but they're also 
really in, in, entrenched in, hey, I want to make sure I help people become the best versions of themselves. Mm-hmm. And it's this cycle of abundance where it keeps paying itself forward for many other people, not only their employees, but also the businesses that they support or work with. It's amazing if you can change your mindset on this, how it really opens up a lot of opportunity. Another thing that we've seen in our experience, now I don't know what the causality is here. It's just really interesting that these two things are related. Folks that we see fall into this 1% in their 40s, they tend to prioritize their health, whether that be their exercise routines or what kind of food they consume or how they treat their bodies. Health and making sure that they stay healthy tends to be one of their top priorities. Now, I'm not saying that healthy living is what results in financial well-being, nor is financial well-being what results in healthy living. But it is interesting, again, in our experience, we've seen those two seem to be married together for folks in their 40s. Well, it's evidence of good decision making. You think about that Warren Buffett documentary that came out a few years ago Mm -hmm. on HBO. He starts off talking to an accounting class saying, hey, imagine that somebody offers you one vehicle. You get to choose any car in the world that you want. But here's the catch. You have to drive that car for your entire it's life. It's the only car you ever get. It's going it's to it's change your decision-making greatly. And I, and I think that's for a lot of people with success. And the, he goes on to share, he's talking about your body. Mm-hmm. Is that If you're going to live as long as Uncle Warren has lived, you do have a lot of look back. I, I, you know, unfortunately, I had to go to a, a, a funeral recently. Um, for a, a, an aunt that I loved and was very benef- you know, helpful and inspirational in my life. But what was so interesting is I got to see a lot of my other relatives. And one of my, one of my uncles, he made a funny joke because he's like, because I hadn't seen him in a number of years. He goes, Brian, if I'd have known I was going to live this long, I'd have treated, my life, I'd have treated <laughs> I myself treat my a little better. better. <laughs> and, it, and there's probably a lot of people, that's why we want to tell you, you do need to prioritize your health. I had a pastor many years ago who, who said, look, the age of 40 is mm-hmm. kind of this fork in the road moment because you can get away with a lot when you're in your 20s and in your 30s. I mean, that's why whenever people get onto their kids about eating that extra cupcake, I'm like, man, I wish I'd have eaten a few more cupcakes when I was younger. <laughs> because it is when you're in your 40, you have to be very deliberate about no, now, now I'm getting the, the the greens. I'm getting the asparagus. I'm, I'm a lot less proteins than I had previously yeah. because you know the barbecue and the brisket aren't happening as much as they are because I am prioritizing my health because it's important to focus on that as a decision maker in your success as well. So let's talk about some of the hacks or some of the commonalities we see amongst folks in this strata. This is really interesting. Again. This is not a requirement. It's just something we see a lot. Folks in their 40s who hit this 1% uh, threshold, generally speaking, equity compensation may make up a significant chunk of their wealth, meaning they likely work for a publicly traded company and part of their compensation comes in the form of RSUs or stock options, or maybe they were involved with a startup and they had some early equity in that. It's not uncommon for these individuals to work in that kind of space and their worth, their net worth also increased in conjunction with the company with which they work. Well, also, if you own a company, that K-1, that Mm flow-through is typically a lot of times, it's it's based upon your ownership. Yep. So that income is going to be tied into your equity as well. So so pay attention to that. Um, They've also, and this is one that I I really try to put out there because so much of our society is this YOLO and the pride and and doing it for the the gram and, and TikTok is you don't waste money trying to impress mm-hmm. others. You know, I remember one of the early things I learned when I read The Millionaire Next Door the first time was that most millionaires are much, they have more pride and happiness from maybe industry accolades mm-hmm. they've received more than the car they drive or yep. the house they live in because I think there's it's back to that passion. What are they put on this earth to do? And that's what they want to be known for not because of the fancy car, mm-hmm. the fancy house, or whatever lifestyle decision, or the tags on the car on the clothes they they, they wear. Don't l- misplace trying to impress others. Because look, as we talked about the messy middle and other phases, most people are dealing with their own life. They're not paying attention mm-hmm. to how fancy you look. Because, and we've also made the joke that like Jay Z. Um, Zuck and others, the richer they get, the poorer they look. <laughs> and I think that ties back to don't worry about impressing others. Another hack that we've seen inside of folks in their 40s is they understand the importance of asset location. So again, to be in this top 1%, they have a net worth somewhere around $8 million. What that doesn't mean is that they 
Their only asset is a business worth $8 million, or they live in an $8 million home. What they generally tend to do is when they build their wealth, it's fairly diversified. They use a number of different vehicles, a number of different accounts, and they understand their access to liquidity so that they also can uh, pursue opportunities that present themselves. Well, I want to hold it up. You know, we have the financial order of operations, and I think this pr primarily happens around step seven and eight of the financial order of operations. Is that not yet? We tell people build up that foundation, mm -hmm. save and invest at 25% of your gross income. But I do think it's interesting around step seven or eight of the financial order of operations. If you are somebody who's in this 1%, you're also making sure you're structuring your assets so that you can take advantage of opportunities. Mm -hmm. We all know the cyclical nature of the economy. Here's something that I think I, you know, people misunderstand. Cash in the past has been trashy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been very low yielding. It doesn't pay much. But here's the reality: if you understood, if I had cash and liquidity above and beyond the 25 percent that I save and invest in after-tax money, it is a valuable wealth mm -hmm. builder when you can jump in and buy when nobody else That's has right. cash. Think about Warren Buffett and all the times and how much money he's built essentially being the bailout component because he had cash when others didn't. If you can understand that asset location and setting yourself up to take advantage of not only being good at what you do, but also being an allocator of resources where they're needed, where others can't go, you will maximize opportunities. All right, Brian, let's talk now a little bit about top 1% in their 50s. And I think that this is really, really interesting because in your 50s, you're either likely at the financial independence point or you're beginning to move towards the financial independence point. What I think is interesting, is we're going to share the numbers, but I think some of the things that they figured out and some of the hacks for 50-year-olds aren't just for those folks in the 1%. You may be in financial independence or approaching financial independence and nowhere near the 1%, and that's okay. The 1% is nothing more than sort of a made-up number that's statistically significant based on the entire population. You may be in the 40th percent and have plenty of money to be able to do the things that you want. So I would, I would not tell you to be discouraged if this is not what your financial circumstance looks like, but be encouraged if these are the things that you figured out and these are the hacks that you're implementing in your well, life. Well, I think it's important because we made this, this observation when we were doing the show prep. Every decade seems to have doubled. Mm -hmm. So you can understand this is is an amplifier. We talk about the power of compounding growth. It makes complete sense. Look, as humans, we think in a linear fashion, meaning that you're like two plus two is four, four plus two is six, mm -hmm. you know, and all, but no, it doesn't work that way. It actually grows exponentially, hence the doubling That's every right. decade. So yes, it's kind of a shock and awe when you see how big the 1% is, but it's not if you think about how much time these people have under their lives mm -hmm. of making good decisions. I mean, think about Warren Buffett. We all know Warren Buffett is a multi-billionaire, one of the richest people on the planet. Do you know, realize though, he didn't make his first billion until he was actually in his 50s? 57, so, I believe. So it is one of those things, pay attention to, you've got to be a good allocator of resources, time, money, that's what this big number is going to indicate. All right, so let's look at the numbers. To be in the top 1% income-wise in your 50s, the average income is a little over half a million dollars a year, right at $501,000. And if you want to be in the top 1% of folks in their 50s net worth-wise, the median net worth is $16,300,000. That's a big number. That is a difficult-to-achieve big number but again, it shows how valuable compounding dollars through time can be. Well, and I, I think this this leads to what have they figured out? And this is, I, and I look at how much life changes from your 20s when you're first starting out to when you get a little more maturity about you. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these 50-somethings aren't very similar to me and others where I know in my 20s, I saved really in a, mm -hmm. in a heavy-handed way because I had in my mind I was retiring between 50 and 55. Sure. As I've quickly approached that age that I originally had laid out as the ultimate end game, that seems like the opposite of what I want to yep. do. And, and that's something that I think is interesting, that retirement may not be the end goal for a lot of these super successful people. 
Um, you've heard us. It was the Simon Sinek book is the Infinite Game. Yeah, yep. I mean that is one where because a lot of business owners, when you start, you think, hey, I'm going to liquidate this business, you know, at this age and then sell off in the sunset. But there's another mindset that says. No, I'm enjoying watching my people grow. I'm enjoying what we're doing to the world. It's, it seems like we're actually having a positive impact, you know, because th- th- that changes your mindset. And here's the data that supports that, Bo. Three in 10 Americans plan to retire before they're 60. I mm-hmm. fell into That's that. That's the plan. That's what they think is going to happen. But check this out. Most wealthy people don't plan to retire until age 70 or later. Not because they can't. Can't I put the extra southern yeah, layer on that? In but there. because they love what they do. I think it's so interesting. All the time, we will sit in financial planning meetings with these people that we're describing. These folks who have extreme wealth built up. Was hey, guess what? Congratulations, you're at financial independence. You don't have to go to work tomorrow, and you're going to be just fine. You can do all those things you want to do. And they'll. This is what we should hear. Okay, yeah, that's great, but I kind of like going to work. There, there are people who depend on me. I get fulfillment out of doing that. I'm able to hire. I'm able to impact people's lives. I'm able to serve my customers well. It's great that I can stop working, but I don't think that I want to. I think folks in their 50s, especially this 1%, have figured out, I'm not working anymore because I have to keep working. I've solved the money problem. I'm working now because I get to keep working. Well, and I I like that that kind of closes out this section with that abundance mindset. They also are very generous Mm -hmm. and they give back. I mean, Dr. Stanley, Millionaire Next Door, Stop Acting Rich, other books affirmed that a lot of people who are in this echelon are actually very generous with not only their resources, but also their time. So let's think about some of the hacks they figured out. This one, I think, is pretty obvious, but it's worth saying. They have figured out that they can get their money to work harder than they do. I mean, that is the actual definition of financial independence. With When the army of dollar bills that you've built can go out and work harder and generate more income than you can with your hands and your back and your feet, then you have reached a point where you have trained your dollars to essentially replace you from an income generation standpoint. Folks in their 50s that fall in this 1% have figured that out. And they have of, often have multiple sources of income, whether it be portfolio income, whether it be rental income, whether it be residual business income, they have figured out how to let their dollars go out and do the working for I, them. I think this point is interesting because I think oh, I mentioned it earlier that most entrepreneurs or business owners and others in this higher echelon, they have what I call entrepreneur fear, mm-hmm. meaning that they think it's going away at any point in time. We wish more NFL players and others who have these big incomes felt that way, but you see it with a lot of business owners What I find interesting is when you are younger and you have this entrepreneurial fear where you're trying to build up assets outside of your company or your wages or your income, if you do that long enough, you will get to this next threshold, which is where your money can actually do the incredible things, not because you have to Mm -hmm. have the money do it, but so it can support your lifestyle, because you get to do stuff thinking outside of yourself in, in, a, in a very grand way, this is how you end up with with some of these, what I call life-changing people mm-hmm. who are creating, you know, media, businesses. They, they don't, they, it's not because they, they have to do this for financial purposes. That doesn't hurt. Right. But it's just because they get to get outside of the necessity of money-making decisions to really the dreaming and really taking, amping this thing up to a whole nother level. But also in our experience as we interact with these folks, one of the common concerns that they've, they've voiced to us, one of the things we see is that they know how important it is not to screw up the next generation. They have been able to achieve what 99% of their peers have not been able to achieve. But in doing that, they also recognize the burden that that can be to the next generation. And so that becomes one of their top priorities. How can I make sure that the success that I've had does not lead to the failure of those that are coming behind yeah, me? Yeah, I'm going to throw out a stat that all my trolls, they hate this when I say it, but then I'm going to give them a little bit of of, of comfort because I'll show them how this all comes back around. When I t- share... That millionaires, 80% of millionaires are first generation, meaning that, you know, they they didn't have gifts or other things that created that success. A lot of people get really upset at that. I mean, you, you'll see it in the comment section as soon as this plays out. But let me go ahead and give you guys some some red meat too. Um, because this is a sad stat, Bo. Mm-hmm. I shared the 80% was first generation, but what's the rest of the story? 
The rest of the story is that by the second generation, meaning that wealth is created in the first generation, the second generation, 70% of the time, wealthy families lose it in the, the second generation, meaning their kids. And then third generation, grandkids, 90% of the time, 90% of the wealth is gone. So, you know, you see how this cleansing cycle of wealth creation puts it right through the wash cycle from the beginning to the end. If you are one of these people that you're in the, you don't even have to be in the top 1%. You just need to be in the top 20% and you're actually on your path to building financial independence. You have children. Pay attention to this, mm-hmm. this stat. Heed this stat. Create some scarcity in your children's lives so that they can hopefully be the exception, the 30% of the children who actually grow upon the assets or the 10% of grandchildren who take wealth and actually build upon it. That's what I would like to see success be in the future, because that's a sad legacy that wealth disappears so quickly. I think it's so interesting. Uh, Being in the top 1% should not be your goal. Uh, That's not a financial goal. That's not something that you should strive for. What you should strive for is being able to do what you want, the way you want, when you want to do it. Perhaps your goal doesn't require you to be in the 1%. Maybe it doesn't require you to be in the 20%. Maybe your goals, the life that you want to leave, only requires you to be in the 50 percentile or the 60th percentile. That's okay. What I think is great, though, is we can look at these super high achievers. We can look at these folks that have achieved that 1% status, and we can take the things that they've done, the hacks that they've figured out, and apply them to our lives so that we can then achieve whatever that financial goal of ours is. The goal should not be, how do I get in the 1%? The goal should be, how do I get to use my money to be a tool to do the things that I want to do? Yeah, be purposeful. Know what you were put on this earth to do. Guys, we love creating this type of content to get you motivated. Yes, these numbers were crazy. But that doesn't mean, I guarantee you, if most of these people, if you showed them this to themselves 30 years earlier, they'd be like, what? Yep, no That's way. That's crazy not town. Use this to harness what is your aptitude, what is your skill set, what's your passion. Get to work so that we can be talking about you in that top 1%. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, Money Guy Team, out.